The transfer portal is open and Oregon is looking around. Here we go. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked On Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day, and your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks. If you have not already, please like, comment, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to or watch this show, which today is brought to you by our friends at Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use code Locked On College for $20 off your first purchase. Lots to get to today. Busy, busy portal news. A less than ideal piece of news for Oregon football as well. And new men's basketball targets. We'll get to that all on today's show. But we start with the two names that stood out to me most tied to Oregon, starting with Jacoby Matthews. Now, yesterday on the show, when the transfer portal opened, I talked about how adding a safety could be something that Oregon is in the market for. And what do you know? Former five-star safety and Texas A&M transfer Jacoby Matthews has reportedly heard from both Oregon and Florida State. Those were the two initial teams. But then a couple more reportedly got into the mix. And certainly there are going to be other teams that, that want a guy of that caliber. He was a highly tied recruit in that 2022 recruiting class for Texas A&M. Andrew Stefaniak over at Locked On Texas A&M said that he was, you know, a bright spot on what was otherwise a pretty poor secondary for the Aggies this past season. But guy has two years of college football experience, five-star recruit. That's the sort of player that I expect Oregon to reach out to in the transfer portal. And it wasn't a shock to see Matthews be kind of the first big name to to pop up there because you know, Oregon has got names, has got depth of talent, but not as much depth of experience at the safety position. So I, I think that going after Matthews is something that makes a lot of sense. And, and anytime you can get a guy who is that high caliber of, of a recruit formally coming, excuse me, coming out of high school, yeah, you take those sorts of guys. Even if they aren't necessarily living up to that level of billing, you know, think about Jordan Burch. He went to South Carolina, big time five star recruit. He's like one of their five highest rated recruits ever over there for, for the Gamecocks. But Burch, you know, went there, had a couple of underwhelming seasons. How happy are we to have Jordan Burch back along the defensive line? Quite is the answer because the guy's a really good player. So I, I think that Matthews is a logical target. Now, it's not going to be easy to get him because Florida State. You know, just had what we'll call a heck of a season. I don't need to dive into all that sort of stuff. I'll just say I think the committee got it right. Sorry, Florida State. But I think that going after a guy that Florida State is also interested in is a testament to his caliber and what sort of player he can be. Because if you look at the way Florida State has attacked the transfer portal, they, they along with Colorado, have really been the biggest. And Ole Miss falls into this category as well. They have been the biggest schools, biggest proponents of the transfer portal that have gone out and you know gotten players who come in and make an impact right away. And I think that Matthews would certainly come into Oregon and start and make an impact rather quickly. So not surprised to see Oregon going after him there. There's room on, on the depth chart to you know at least create some competition for, for more playing time. But I don't know that Matthews would come to Oregon if he didn't you know have a good idea that, that he was going to start. So that's the first name. Now here's the second name. And this one... I, I cannot say I was expecting or even understand. Georgia running back Andrew Paul has reportedly heard from Oregon. Now, th this could just be a feeler text. This could be a phone call or just, hey, how you doing from Oregon's new running backs coach, Rashad Samples. But Paul's a guy who ran for 129 yards last year didn't have a ton of carries and I did not have on my list of potential transfer portal needs or, or wants for Oregon football running back. That would have been pretty far down on my priority list. I, I'd put it above, you know, quarterback for instance, but I don't know what other position group 
I would have had a lower priority on because you look at, you know, Oregon's running back room and Dan Lanning had some nice things to say recently about Jordan James that, you know, he feels like he's running angry, which I feel like is how Jordan James has always run. So if he's saying that again, I I think he's, you know, ready to step it up another level and have a really, really big season as at least one of the top two guys, maybe the number one guy for, for the Ducks this coming fall. But I like Oregon's running back depth a lot. And, and even with the transfer of Dante Dowdell, which I was pretty bummed about because I think Dowdell, who's at Nebraska now, has got a lot of potential and, and could have been a really, really good player. I think having Jay Harris and Jaden Lamar in there as your number three and four backs, I think it's a pretty good situation to be in. I mean, you look at where Oregon was at last year, it was Bucky Irving and Noah Whittington, and then Jordan James was your number three who had also had a true freshman season in which he didn't play a ton. Now, he played more than Jaden Lamar did this past year, but, you know, in the limited work we've seen from Jaden Lamar, I I like what I've seen. And I think that Jay Harris has got a lot of potential. He could be the short yardage back this year if Oregon wants to have someone who is, you know, specifically in that sort of role, a la Jordan James in 2022 or Cyrus Habibi Likio in 2018 and 19. So I I think that for, for Oregon, adding a running back, you know, if you feel like he is better than someone on your roster, which would probably be Jane Lamar, since Jay Harris is someone who was brought in this transfer portal cycle, I, I guess you go ahead and do it. I just didn't have that pegged as a need. It wasn't really even in my mind at all about, you know, could Oregon go after a running back? Like when I saw that he'd heard from Oregon, now there are a lot of other schools that expressed interest as well. It's a pretty impressive offer list. Uh, It's not, you know, uh, as prestigious of uh, a number of schools that are are going after Andrew Paul. Again, he's transferred from Georgia, but you know, when, like, when you compare to the list of schools that are, that are going to go after, uh, Matthew, Jacoby Matthews, then, you know, it's a little bit different, but if Paul is transferring, I imagine it's because he wants to see more touches. I don't know that Oregon is the place for him, uh, to do that. So that one caught me by surprise, but those were kind of the biggest portal names tied to Oregon uh, yesterday. Now, one piece of news that, uh, is not something you ever like to hear is that uh, Oregon defensive back Dalen Austin, who was a 2023 recruit and a top 150 player, redshirted this past year and, you know, just didn't play a lot because there were a lot of names ahead of him on the depth chart. He was arrested in, I think it was Lane County for uh, a hit and run. That's all we know right now. And I'm not going to say, I, I felt like it was important to bring up because that's a guy who could conceivably work his way into the rotation this year for the Ducks. Do I expect him to? Not necessarily. But that's someone who at this point in time is not with uh, with the Oregon football program. So that was kind of the latest uh, that, that came out of Oregon yesterday with the portal. Could there be other options out there? I got a question that came in, which I love answering mailbag questions. It's one of my favorite elements of hosting this particular show about a big name defensive back who's in the transfer portal. Could Oregon add, as DJ Collard would say, another one? I have been told that I am a competitive person and my competitive side, which is definitely there. It's a big fan of Monopoly Go. I'm sure you've heard of it. It's been downloaded over 150 million times. I've got it on my phone as well. It's a great twist on Monopoly where you play on not one, but hundreds of Monopoly boards in crazy locations, building up amazing cities that bring you big money. But the best part is messing with your friends because you can change, you can charge them rent on iconic properties just like in classic Monopoly, but you can also rob their vaults of riches for yourself. It's not just your competitive side that'll love it just like mine. You can team up with friends and people all around the world in time tournaments to earn huge Rewards. So get in the game and join your friends. Download Monopoly Go now free on the App Store or Google Play. So as every dayers out there know, mailbag is always open. YouTube comments or X formerly known as Twitter. If you want priority access and all sorts of other perks, go join the flock over at Subtext. One of you asked me a question about Cormani McLean, who is the former five-star number one overall defensive back in the class of 2023, originally from Lakeland, Florida. Look, if McLean came to the Ducks, I, I first of all, I'd be surprised. I, I would be 
wildly surprised if Oregon was able to get on his radar, not just because of the the playing time factor, because Oregon's already brought in a bunch of quality transfers in, in the secondary, even if Dalen Austin is not going to be with, with the team going forward, the cornerback depth is is just fine. And McLean, really talented guy, but in his first year at Colorado, he played nine games, started four, had 13 tackles and two pass breakups. So you know, he's not a refined product at this time. He's got a lot of upward potential. But for McLean, I would be shocked. And I, I mean shocked if he doesn't wind up in Miami. The Canes have a need in, in the secondary, according to Alex Dono of Locked On Canes. And they were one of the teams, obviously, since, you know, he's from the, the state of Florida that was heavily recruiting this guy coming out of high school. I'd be more than a little bit surprised if, if the former Colorado corner doesn't end up wearing the the green and orange down there for our old friend Mario Cristobal. So I, I, I can appreciate the thought, right? Go get the most talented players that you possibly can. Get anybody, get everybody out there that you can. But I do not think that Cormani, Cormani McLean will be a target for, for the Ducks in the transfer portal. I think as it pertains to the secondary, I think they're done. I, I think Oregon's secondary is what it is. Jalil Florence tweeted out a thinking emoji. I don't know why he hangs us... Uh, you know, by a thread like that. But then he tweeted out, you know, that he'll be back. And, you know, I think he's still working his way back from the injury a little bit. But as expected, Jaleel Florence not going anywhere. I, I expect him to be Oregon's number two outside corner going into next season. That's what he was last year behind Kyrie Jackson. And I, I think he will probably end up being that again. Let's get into the mailbag here even further. This one came in with the transfer portal opening back up in less than a day. This was before the portal and the Oregon spring game not happening until the 26th. Do you think Oregon has a small benefit from the spring game being on a later date? It's April 27th, which is 10 days away as the show airs. Players position on the depth chart still being more of an unknown compared to a school who are playing their games before or early into the portal process. So no is the short answer. It's not a major advantage. I see how you arrive at that conclusion. But the portal is open to enter April 16th to April 30th. That's the window just to enter the transfer portal. You can come out of the portal at any time. So the initial window was, what, January, you know, 30 days after your season ends or, or something like that, right? When, when, when players went in the transfer portal the first time around in the completely backwards and messed up college football calendar that, that we have right now in this great and wonderful sport. Those guys can go in during that window, but they may not come out of the portal and find a home until who knows, right? You could go in if the portal window closes on, you know, April 30th, someone who entered on April 18th might not find a school that he wants to commit to until May 4th or May 8th, and he can come out uh, at, at that particular time. So uh, that, that's not uh, a huge a huge benefit there, but it is a good reminder. It is a really good reminder that the spring game is April 27th. We are just not that far away. And if you got any questions leading into that game, of course, drop them below. This one came over from uh, the subtext community, and this is a really, really good question and a good thing to be thinking about going into this year when you think about, you know, is Oregon's roster good enough to, you know, compete for a national championship? Every team that wins a national championship, they send a bunch of guys to the NFL draft. There's rarely a team that gets there that isn't going to do that. You know, Michigan and Washington last year, a lot of guys about to go off to the NFL at all, at all sorts of positions. And of course, Oregon now is one of them in uh, Jabbar Muhammad, who will be uh, an NFL guy. So this question came in, assuming a duck is chosen in the first round later this month, who do you think has the best chance of being drafted in the first round of the 2025 draft to extend Oregon's first round draft streak to six years? Thanks, T. Beck. Love the sign off there. So I think that Oregon is almost guaranteed to have a first round draft pick in the upcoming NFL draft, which is April 25th, I believe. And whether it's Bo Nix, Jackson Powers, Johnson, or Troy Franklin, not entirely sure. I'd be surprised any of them could fall to the second round. I think at least one of them does, maybe two. I'd be surprised if all three fall out of that first round. So uh, going back to your question, though, for next year, I think there, there are a couple of candidates. And, and certainly Oregon's roster is in a really good place. 
I do think some development can still be, you, you know, worked upon with the roster to get the most out of guys. So one guy that, that I definitely look at as a first round caliber player for, for the Ducks on the team right now is Evan Stewart. So Evan Stewart is the five-star wide receiver transfer from Texas A&M was wildly underutilized because their offense was just a mess with Jimbo Fisher in, in his last two seasons. He's a guy who has two years of eligibility left. So he could be with the Ducks for the next two seasons. But if he has a big time year, he's an NFL guy. They just don't make receivers who run and, and cut and have the ball skills and leaping ability with the speed of Evan Stewart. He has first round potential. That will depend though on how successful he is in Oregon's offense this year. And I expect him to be Oregon's leading receiver. I, I think he slides right in to take Troy Franklin's role from a year ago and be the top target for the, for the Ducks, particularly pushing the ball down the field. I think Treshawn Holden will be involved in that as well. But if Evan Stewart has the sort of year he's capable of, he could be a, he could be a first round pick. Another name I'd look at as a potential first round pick who I just mentioned, Jabbar Muhammad. Guy's a really good corner. Shut down, lock down, everything. Puts you in a box, two thumbs down, everything. Like that That guy, as we saw, is really good. And when he was matched up in the Pac-12 title game, now in the first meeting up in Seattle, Troy Franklin you know, got him for a pass interference down the field, beat him in a 1v1, and had a great game overall. Muhammad came back in the Pac-12 title game and put the clamps on a guy who we all know is a really, really high-end receiver in Troy Franklin. So, I fully expect that Franklin will, you know, be a, a really good receiver. And when I watch Muhammad just lock him down like that and make life tough for him, that's when I, I mean, that's why I'm excited to have Muhammad as a part of Oregon secondary. So I, I think that he could be a candidate for, you know, a first round draft selection as well. Another guy who I wouldn't sleep on, I could pick two guys here, but I, I wouldn't sleep on a Johnny Cornelius. You know, Connerly was the more highly rated recruit, although Cornelius coming over from Rhode Island is someone who, you know, schools like Alabama wanted in the transfer portal in last year's cycle. And, you know, we've seen how good he is at, at that right tackle position. But I think that Cornelius, if he's able, you know, to really, really up his run blocking abilities can be great. You know, he, he, the, the numbers that, that fly around on, on Twitter all the time are how few pressures he allows and how good he is in pass protection. He, he is, you know, built like an NFL guy. He's got great athleticism, really good player. If he really dominates in the run game this year and puts some good film on, on for NFL draft scouts this season, I could see him sliding up into that, into that range, right? It, it, it's really hard, not impossible, but it's hard to be an offensive lineman and be taken in the first round. It'd be impressive, impressive if JPJ does it, but he is at a position, and this applies to Josh Connerly as well, where if you stand out in a big way, tackle is the position on the offensive line that gets taken in the first round. It, it, it's very rarely you see an interior guy go in the first round of the NFL draft, not uh, unheard of, but it's just not something that is quite as common because tackle is just a more highly coveted position because you're going up against the edge rushers who are usually the best and highest paid players on the opposing teams that you're playing in, in the NFL. So I, I would look at those guys, you know, and other players are going to get drafted, right? Jordan Birch will will get drafted. He, he's just too big of a physical presence and just um, guy guys just a beast. I can't see him not getting drafted. Uh, Jeff Bossa probably gets taken in the later rounds if he has uh, another really good year. I'm, I'm just thinking through who else could get drafted more generally. I, I think that, you know, Muhammad Stewart and either Cornelius or Connerly uh, at the tackle spots would be the first round options, but uh, I, I don't think you'll you'll have a running back in there. You know, T. Ferg will get drafted. I, he's not going to go in the first round, but he'll be uh, a later round pick to be sure. I, I think those are the guys who you know have that sort of first round potential, and you know Oregon has to have those guys have big seasons, right? They need to have big seasons for their NFL draft stock, but those are also you know really key players for the Ducks uh, in in 2024. So great question, absolutely love it. What I didn't love was Oregon basketball missing on a couple of really, really highly sought after transfer portal targets, but new names have emerged. 
so too has Yahoo Finance, a sponsor here at the Locked On Network. So for more than 25 years, Yahoo Finance has been the brand behind every great investor. So let's just get straight to the point. You want to grow your portfolio to deal with rising costs of inflation, to pay off your debt or your mortgage, pretty much anything standing in the way of you and financial freedom, right? With Yahoo Finance, you can get access to the news, data, and tools you need in order to help reach that financial freedom. Whether you're a seasoned investor or you're looking for extra guidance, Yahoo Finance gives you all the tools and data you need in one place. They're the number one finance destination, so go check them out today. For comprehensive financial news and analysis, visit the brand behind every great investor, yahoofinance.com. The number one financial destination, yahoofinance.com. That's yahoofinance.com. Go check them out today. Well, the transfer portal is not just alive for Oregon football. It still exists for college basketball as well, and Oregon still has needs in the transfer portal. So they missed on Tony Perkins. Umar Balo did officially commit to uh, Indiana per John Rothstein. So the top two transfer portal desires I had for the Ducks this offseason, they're off the board, but in come the next wave of targets. So Oregon has reportedly reached out to uh, Dayton sharpshooter Kobe Brea, I believe is how you pronounce his last name, B-R-E-A. And when I say sharpshooter, I mean about 49% from three this past season. He's been a flyer with Dayton for the last uh, four seasons. He's got one year of eligibility left. And I, I can't ever, 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 ever say no to a guy that shoots it that well from three. I, I, I just can't. And he, now he's got a laundry list of teams that that have reached out to him and Oregon is not uh the the only suitor I don't even know frankly if they're the top suitor for for Bray's services in his final year uh, of college basketball but certainly that'd be a welcome addition and you would have just kind of a concoction of wings not necessarily a Jermaine Kuznar type who you know is your alpha and, and your leader but you would have a mix of size shooting and depth at the wing position that I I can get behind there but Arguably the bigger name that, that Oregon is going after that I would love to see them get is Cliff Amori. So this is this guy's name is spelled like Eugene Omarugi. We all remember Bill Walton. Eugene from Eugene. He was like his favorite college basketball player ever. And I, I think that o, Amori w- would be so good. So, so good. Now, there are other big men in the transfer portal. It's not the only option, but... Here's a list of schools that have lift, that have reached out to uh, Amori, and he is a big man at Rutgers, by the way, who has also played four years of college basketball. North Carolina, UCLA, Kansas State, Georgia Tech, Georgetown, Baylor, Alabama, Oregon, Washington, Georgia, St. John's, and Mississippi State. So Oregon's trying to emerge out of the pack with some pretty heavy hitters. I mean, anytime you got Mick Cronin at UCLA, Hubert Davis at North Carolina, Jerome Tang at, at Kansas State's a good coach. Georgia Tech, I think they just had a uh, decent season. I, I, I could be wrong about that, frankly. Baylor and Scott Drew, who just basically, you know, in a, in a public way, a la Dan Lanning, turning down the Alabama job, said no to Kentucky and that he was, you know, 10 toes down staying uh, w- with Baylor. Alabama, Nate Oates, they just went to the Final Four. Washington's got Danny Sprinkle now, which is a really good hire. Georgia, a team that Oregon beat early last year, they, they've, they, they had a pretty nice year. They were in the NIT. But uh, St. John's, Rick Patino, and then Mississippi State with, with Chris Jans, who uh, has been a grinder in the coaching world and is uh, a heck of a college basketball coach. So that's quite the lineup of guys to go up against. But what you got to remember, Oregon's got Dana Altman, and Oregon's got program momentum right now because of the way they ended this year. If – Oregon had not made the NCAA tournament, I wouldn't give them a great chance here. I wouldn't feel great about the Ducks' chances to go get Amori here from from Rutgers. But guy is 6'11", and when I say that he is a great fit for the Ducks, much like Umar Balo, I'm saying he's a great fit for the Ducks. So, two reasons why, why Amori would be exactly what Oregon's looking for. I think he could step in and be the starting center right away because that's what he has done. I'll get to that in a moment. But this past year, he averaged about 10 points a game, a little over eight rebounds, and almost three blocks a game. Guy's just a force in there. When you think about 
all the big men and all the shot blockers and then Folly Dante, Jordan Bell, Kenny Wooten, everybody who have been at the heart of these Dana Altman defenses, Amore is a guy that would fit right in. Here is perhaps the most important element of why Cliff Amore would be absolutely perfect for the Ducks. Over the last three seasons, he has not come off the bench in a single game. He did his freshman year for 23 games, but he has made 98 consecutive starts. Now, that's what his stat profile says. I don't know if he's missed a game here or there. Here's what I do know. Over three seasons as a big man, starting 98 games, that's over 30 games a year for those of us that are math majors out there. That has been a fleeting factor in the Oregon front court. You have not seen big men consistently stay healthy for several years now. Kenny Wooten wasn't a guy, I don't think, that, that got hurt regularly, but Dante and Biddle over the last couple of years have not been able. Frank Kepnong got hurt as well. You, you, they just that, that might have happened when Kepnong transferred to Washington. I think I think my timeline mentally might be off on that. So I, I think that this guy would be so great for two reasons. Number one, you want someone who's reliable. He is that. Reliable, productive, experienced. Uh, a couple of years ago, he was preseason all Big Ten first team uh, at Rutgers. Helped him to the NCAA tournament that year. The, the veteran experience is there. Plug and play starter. Fits with what Dane Altman wants to do. You know, you can give him the ball down low, but he's got a big defensive presence. But the consistency of play in the front court is not just great because it allows Dane Altman to do what he's historically done, which is tinker with lineups early in the year and then figure it out at the end of the season and have them play their best basketball consistently. Now, I did that this year, but it wasn't quite as smooth, right? You had a, you had more stumbles than you, you would normally see with a Dane Altman team in, in February. And then, of course, they turned it on in March uh, big time there. But it would allow Nate Biddle having Amori in there if he's able to, again, stay injury-free. It would allow Nate Biddle to not have to carry too heavy of a workload. You know, he had a wrist injury this year, and then he got sick and he lost a bunch of weight. And hopefully he's going to be able to, you know, get that back and get back to, to full strength in there. But I, I do not feel confident. And, and clearly the Oregon staff, if they're reaching out to a guy like Amori, they don't either. I do not feel confident having Nate Biddle as Oregon starting center, not because he isn't talented enough. He is. And I, I think he can be such a big time player, like all conference caliber guy when he's you know have able to have a, a fully healthy season but that's the trick <laughs> like that, that's the problem is if he's not out there as often because amori is taking up a lion's share of the minutes that increases the likelihood that you have him available down the stretch and then you can play a little offense defense or you know play him at the four or play him with kj evans you, you can do all sorts of stuff and, and a three-man front court rotation of KJ Evans, Nate Biddle, and Cliff Amori would be stellar. I, I mean, you talk about having size, length, shot blocking, shooting, everything is there. I don't believe Amori is a, a big three-point shooter. I'm going to double check that real quick, but he, he's someone who would be such a great fit. He's, he's 6'11", 240. He's originally from Nigeria. You know, and Fali Dante was originally from, from Mali. And, you know, I, I'm sure having that sort of background for Dana Altman, and he's taken a couple of guys from uh, from Africa in the past, I think it can help. You know, you look at what Randy Bennett has done at St. Mary's, for instance. He's got the Australian pipeline because he's worked with this guy, he's worked with that guy. So uh, that that's one of the reasons that I looked at this. I saw Oregon had offered him, and then I was diving into all the factors about him. I go, well, you know, Dana's brought in those uh, th those sorts of guys before. Uh, he is not a three-point shooter. He's one of five from beyond the arc this past year, but that, that's not why Oregon needs him. They, they need someone of that caliber. And look, if Amori ends up going elsewhere, then you, you want to search for a guy of that caliber who is a veteran, who has got size, who you know is going to be productive and you don't have questions about. Because there's the health question with Nate Biddle, but there isn't necessarily a production question there. So bringing in a guy like this that just doesn't have a lot of questions, 
I, I think would be a really, really good addition for the Ducks. Last thing before I get out of here for today, Oregon baseball had a midweek game against a uh, red hot Gonzaga team. They'd won seven in a row or 10 and two in uh, WCC play. And Oregon jumped out to an 11, nothing lead in the fourth inning. And then the bullpen had some, shall we say, struggles in the seventh inning. They allowed seven runs in the seventh. It got all the way back to 11-9 in shades of the A's winning their 20th game in a row, a la Moneyball. Of course, it happened in real life, too. Was, you know, coming into my head. But luckily, Oregon hit uh, six home runs on the day. Jacob Walsh had two of them. He's, of course, Oregon's all-time uh, home run record holder. Mark, he set uh, this season. He's in the mid 30s uh, for his career. Guy just is smashing the ball all over the yard. But it was a good starting effort. And uh, Logan Mercado eventually came in, closed the door. Oregon won the game 14 to 9. And they take on Stanford later this week. Cardinal, as always in baseball, very good. Appreciate everyone listening. I'll see you next time. Have a wonderful rest of your day and go, Ducks.